Okay, well, Bula Vinaka, Maori, welcome, Talofa and Malo, and uh, very happy International Women's Day to everybody. Uh, thank you for thank you to everyone for joining us today, whether you're uh, from the Pacific region or, or beyond. We we welcome you uh, to today's event. Um, so today we're going to talk about women in green innovation, and I'm very excited. Uh, to hear from our wonderful panel uh, in, in the next few minutes, but I'm just here to, to, to start us off with the, with the sort of basics. Um, so to start with, I'll just say on behalf of the Global Green Growth Institute, we're very pleased to bring you today's event um, in collaboration with a number of wonderful partners, Mstret Space from Papua New Guinea, Greenhouse Coworking from Fiji, Samoa Business Hub, Tonga Youth Employment and Entrepreneurship, and Vanuatu Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And so we're here today to uh, learn from our panel and also share ideas and illuminate elements of um, green innovators, um, and in particular, green entrepreneurs, and explore the challenges and opportunities for female entrepreneurs, and think about um, the I ideas and the inspiration for green entrepreneurs, particularly in the Pacific region. And then if we just move to the next slide, uh, we have just briefly on the agenda. So the welcome, and we're here to celebrate the uh, theme for today, this year's International Women's Day from the United Nations, in particular, green, gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow, uh, which recognizes the contribution of women and girls around the world who are leading the charge on climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and responses to build a more sustainable future for all. Um, so, as, as mentioned, we're here really to, to listen to the panelists, so I will try to move to that quite quickly. Um, and we also have time for audience Q&A, so please do use the, the Q&A function um, that you'll see on the screen, and um, either as, as we're going along or, or wait to the end, um, feel free to save up your questions. Um, we will briefly touch on upcoming events and in particular to talk about uh, future networking, virtual networking events that um, we'll like to host and have all of you who are joining us today uh, to participate in. So just on housekeeping, um, the session is going to be, uh, is being recorded and we'll share this online later for those who aren't able to, to join us uh, today, right at that moment. Um, and we'd also encourage you, as I see there's already some, some chat on the chat, which is wonderful. Um, please do, we do encourage you to introduce yourself on the chat and say where you're from um, and reach out to other people um, on, the, on the call and, and connect um, after today's event as well. And if you have any issues uh, with, our, with technical issues, um, sorry, just on the next slide, please. Um, you, could, you could contact our colleague, Q, who is um, doing an excellent job of uh, helping us with the IT. Okay, great. And so just very briefly, move to the next slide. I'd just like to start with a quick poll to see who is in the audience with us. Um, so as a webinar, we don't get to see your, your lovely faces, which I'd love to see. But um, since we do have a poll function, I thought I'd just ask, you know, where you guys are from, um, you know, what, what gender um, you associate with, and um, you know, what sector you, you work with. So you should hopefully see a poll on the screen now. There's just three brief questions. Um, it'd be great, great to see who we've got in the audience. I'll just leave it open for, for about a minute or so. And just while I'm waiting for you guys to, to enter your answers there, um, as mentioned, we will have, um, so we'll have a, a Google form link that we'll share later in the session. Just keep your eye out for that. We'll share that in the chat because um, we'd like to, you to um, sign up for future networking events that we'll talk about a bit later, as well as give us some feedback on today's session and what we can do or we, what we'd like to see in future uh, sharing and, and networking events. Awesome. So we've got so far about um, 30 people have responded, but I think some more responses are coming in. So please, please keep coming in. So far, it's looking like we have a lot of people from Fiji. That's great. Also, um, Papua New Guinea um, and some a few from Kiribati and Samoa as well. Oh, and we have, yes, Tonga and Vanuatu. Sorry, I need to scroll down. Great. So we've got really good representation, mostly from the Pacific region, although a couple of colleagues and um, peers from elsewhere. 
Um, looks like the majority of people so far uh, identify as women, which is which is great, but also really great to see that there's about 20% so far um, who are men and male supporters of, of women, which is wonderful. Um, and in terms of uh, the sectors, it looks like quite a good spread here. I can see a number of people in agriculture and agribusiness who are also working in climate change, community development, um, and, and entrepreneurial support services as well. That's awesome. Great. May I keep the chat coming as well. All right. Excellent. Well, I might just end that there. That's, that's really great. I know that more people will be joining, but thanks. Thank you for that. It's nice to have a sense of who's with us uh, today in the room. Okay, and so just um, for the, the last slide for me is I will just uh, briefly, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our wonderful moderator for today's session. Um, Helena McLeod uh, from the Global Green Growth Institute is um, our Deputy Director General and the Head of Green Growth Planning and Implementation. Um, in this role, she leads um, over 30 country offices uh, spread throughout Latin America, Africa, Asia, the Middle East and the Pacific and their implementation work to achieve economic growth that's environmentally sustainable, socially inclusive and climate compatible. She has over 25 years of experience designing and leading innovative development programs and multidisciplinary teams in the area of green cities, renewable energy, sustainable transport, climate smart agriculture, forest preservation, climate resilience, trade and regional economic integration. She's also no stranger to the Pacific region. She, I know she's lived and worked um, in Fiji as a senior resource advisor in the Pacific, for the South Pacific Applied Geoscience Commission and Fiji Mineral Resources Department. I think she might elaborate a little bit more on that later perhaps. She holds a Master of Science degree in Environment and Natural Resource Economics from the University College London and is a strong advocate for women and people with disabilities. There's a lot more, but I'll leave it there and say hand over to you now, Helena. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Esther. What a wonderful day to be here with you all. And I just am so proud and inspired to be with all of you women and women entrepreneurs today. So it's such a special occasion and such an important day. So to help me set the scene, let's watch a brief video developed by UN Women to mark International Women's Day. Earth, our only home. Invaluable, but not invulnerable. Are we too late to save it? Climate change is making our world more dangerous, more fragile, more unequal. In these uncertain times, women and girls face a disproportionate threat of displacement, poverty, and violence. But women and girls are also a powerful force in climate action. As innovators in green energy, as defenders of the environment, and as educators of our generation and the next. Gender equality is not just a woman's issue. It's the path to our survival. So it's not too late to invest in climate action by and for women. Not too late to empower women entrepreneurs and decision makers at home. Not too late to give voice and power to this next generation of Earth champions. It's not too late to demand commitments to build an equal and enduring future for all. Championing climate action by and for women and girls is the key to saving our planet. Join the fight for gender equality today so that together we can create a sustainable tomorrow. It's not too late. Gosh, what a moving and inspiring video. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> so one of the great things um, about um, 
my my life is I've got to experience such amazing countries and as Esther mentioned, I've I've lived and worked in the Pacific, and I had the the real privilege to to not just work in Fiji, but um, to work in a number of the countries like the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, and a number of others. And I really do feel you, uh, I mean, you couldn't be richer in terms of the natural environment and the social fabric of where you work. Um, the power of the people is so strong in the Pacific. Um, and it is incredibly rich. I, and I'm also very aware how vulnerable the islands are. So one of the, the things I did when I was in the Pacific is I worked on one of the first international vulnerability indexes, looking at all the different challenges that the Pacific Islands find um, in terms of the natural environment and also things like waste. So anyway, it's really wonderful to be with you today. Now, before I introduce our wonderful panel, I'd like to start by mentioning why this topic is important to me and to GGGI. As you heard from that video, women have a vital role to play as entrepreneurs and innovators in developing solutions and innovations to build climate resilience in the region in ways that support their communities, women and girls. Women are strong advocates for green recovery in their nations. However, many women entrepreneurs struggle with access to funding, formalizing their businesses and cultural norms and responsibilities that can make pursuing a startup business difficult compared with their male counterparts. And I actually come from a, an entrepreneurial family. So actually not my mum, but my dad was an entrepreneur and I'm aware just how difficult it is um, and how stressful it can be when you go into business on your own. Now we celebrate today the United Nations International Women's Day theme, Gender Equality, Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow, which recognizes the contribution of women and girls around the world who are leading the charge on climate change adaptation, mitigation, and responses to build a more sustainable future for all. Did you know, for instance, that women entrepreneurs are 5% more likely than men to be innovative in their businesses? Studies show that women are more likely than their male counterparts to start a business with a social and or environmental purpose. And they also play an important role in helping national economies transition from developing to innovation and knowledge-based economies. When we think of innovation, we often think new ideas, research, cutting edge and exciting stuff. And it is of course, all those things. But it's also taking innovations from elsewhere and applying them in ways that work in our own communities and countries. It's rediscovering the wisdom of the past that we may have forgotten, reapplying traditions in new modern contexts. Innovation in the Pacific and globally refers not only to brand new ideas, technologies or products, but also harnessing old or traditional ideas in new ways such as reintroducing traditional cultural and indigenous ways of thinking into the market. It is my pleasure to now introduce our panelists who are joining us from different countries virtually. Between them, they have a wonderful wealth and diversity of experience in green innovation and entrepreneurship, encompassing government, community development, entrepreneurship and support. And we are grateful to have them join us to share their perspectives on the opportunities and challenges for women in green innovation in their countries and the region, to spark inspiration and ideas for women green entrepreneurs and innovators to take the next step towards a sustainable tomorrow. Our first panelist is Ms. Tuobini Anna Nuariki from Kiribati. Anna is a mother of four, her children have been her great inspiration to get involved in climate change. She is a senior high school teacher by profession and has been teaching for nearly 20 years. She is now gender and youth officer at the Kiribati Outer Islands Food and Water Project, working in nine outer islands to build the capacity of women and youth and make them resilient citizens by ensuring that they are given freedom of rights to speak and benefit from the project's activities. She is also a passionate volunteer for the Kiribati Climate Action Network, Kirikan, for nearly 10 years and has been a key voice for her country in global climate change conferences and training in New Zealand, Fiji, Australia and COP25 in Madrid, Spain, 
telling their stories on how climate change has been affecting their lives. Welcome today, Anna. Next, let me introduce Miss Dorothy Kukum from Papua New Guinea. Dorothy is an agripreneur by practice and profession with over 20 years of work experience with PNG's Enga Provincial Government. She is currently serving as Director, Community Development, working with youth, women and vulnerable people, including people living with disabilities, elderly, widows, orphans, in rural and remote rural villages. And I may just take this moment to add that I'm also a mother. <laughs> I've got two beautiful boys and my little boy is extremely disabled. He's, um, he's got very severe cerebral palsy, so he can't walk or talk or use his arms. And he's an inspiration to me every day. So wonderful that you are also empowering these, these um, beautiful people. She is also a proactive member of the Anger Provincial Climate Change Committee that informs local governments on the effects of climate change and recommends strategies for implementation at the households in the province and has been active in dialogue with GGGI on climate resilience, green growth strategies, engagements in Anger Province. She is known to the GGGI team as Dynamic Dorothy. She regards herself as a climate warrior and is a strong advocate on ch climate change issues and innovative approaches, identifying pragmatic solutions and making her community climate proof. Welcome, Dorothy. Our third panelist is Ms. Vera Chesinta Chute from Fiji. Vera is an experienced and well known entrepreneur as managing director of family owned recycled clothing chain Value City, which has 15 branches across Fiji and franchises in Tonga and Kiribati. Her professional memberships and achievements include vice president and board member of the Fiji Australia Business Council board member of the Fiji Commerce, Commerce and Employers Federation, past executive board member of Women in Business and past vice chair of Women Entrepreneurs Business Council. In 2014, she received the Women in Business Businesswoman of the Year Award. Vera is a strong advocate of recycling and upcycling through her businesses and is a mother of two and doting grandmother of four. She has special interest in philanthropic work mentoring and assisting women in SMEs and the informal sector to give them financial independence. Welcome, Vera. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Rebecca Bulgari from Vanuatu. Rebecca holds a PhD in economics from the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing, China. She is currently the national manager for the Vanuatu Business Resilience Council the Standing Committee of the Vanuatu Chamber of Commerce and Industry with a focus on coordinating and engaging the private sector for climate change and disaster risk reduction activities and policy dialogue. Prior to that, she was the Senior National Facilitator for the PHAMA Plus Programme in Vanuatu for over six years. Her key areas of expertise are public-private partnerships, stakeholder relation management, strategic policy advice, and organizational management. Welcome, Rebecca. Our fifth panelist is Ms. Tualima Sina Retsav from Samoa. Tualima is a mother of three and a well known entrepreneur. She runs Samoa Global News online news site and a consultancy firm specializing in professional development training and strategic planning. Tua Loma was the first woman president of Samoa's Chamber of Commerce and has served on numerous government boards. She is currently a member of the government's remuneration tribunal, the first woman have, to have been appointed to this panel. She is one of two women on the Samoa Rugby Union Board. Tua Loma currently serves as chair for the Samoa Business Hub, supporting business growth through mentoring and facilitating access to finance for for micro, small and medium enterprises. Tualoma is a gender-based finance research fellow and actively advocates for enhanced national understanding of issues, root causes, contributing factors and early warning signs of intimate partner violence. Her research outlines a national holistic approach as a solution to combating violence and welcome Tualoma. 
And last but definitely not least is Miss Lucia Latu Jones from Tonga. Lucia is based in Tonga with her husband and their two dogs. She is the founder and director of Tonga Youth Employment and Entrepreneurship, a self-funded youth NGO established in 2014 to address youth unemployment in Tonga by helping young school leavers aged 18 to 35 through skills development, employment, entrepreneurship, and mentorship support. She is a recognized change agent who is passionate about turning ideas into action and impact, and has recently been working with GGGI as our Tonga Green Entrepreneurship Consultant. She works to support young and women green entrepreneurs in an innovation challenge program in Tonga with the goal to create support and facilitate innovative businesses that are sustainable and resilient in the Kingdom of Tonga. So welcome to you all. <laughs> I feel I'm incredibly inspired just to be in your presence. You've achieved so much for, for so many people. It's really wonderful to be with you today. So now in terms of our Tananoa discussion, I'm going to ask the panelists a few questions <laughs> and then it would be wonderful if the panelists could give their answers. Um, when you're speaking it would just be great if you can turn, if who's speaking can just turn on their video, I think all our videos are on, and just to keep the responses brief to perhaps two to three minutes to the questions that, that I pose you. Thank you so much. So my, my first question to all the panelists is could you briefly tell us your story of how your own personal experience fits with the concept of green innovation and what inspired you to work in this space. Um, so I'm open to volunteers or we can just also go from the top of the list if you would like. <laughs> Maybe, who would like to go first? What about Anna? Anna, would you like to go first? Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone, and happy Women's Day to all. Uh, I'll start with what inspired me to become one of the green and innovative app activists. What inspired me to work in the space of green innovation is a rapid onset event. This is the sea inundation hitting my home in, the 19, 20, in, 20, in 2012, December. This was a single wave that washed away our food crops and inundated our well water, the only means of um, drinking source for our community. This has been an inspirational event with what me, which motivated me to act. I started by introducing climate change impacts in the internal assessment I usually do for Form 6 when later I joined the Girikan as a volunteer, working with grassroots communities as a climate advocate and activist, giving retreats to youth and teachers on care for Mother Earth, and now working as a gender and youth officer for the Kiribati Out Islands Food and Water Project as a gender and youth officer. Um, knowing that Kiribati is a small island state least developed country and small governments within the Pacific Island regions, where capacity is, is almost everything, and especially at the grassroots level, is always a big challenge. And working in the nine uh, project islands, this is what I call the heart of the green innovation, where we have to work with communities, working with the women, uh, building capacities of women, and empowering them to speak giving them the space um, to be heard by the community as well. And from there, we work with them and working on the ground, giving the, um, the training on the on-hand training, whereby we um, train them on the modern, modern technology, which we also integrate with our traditional knowledge on agriculture. This had motivated most women and within the nine islands, we are able to um, empower them and make them uh, realize that they also have an effort and can do for themselves. So in these nine, nine outer islands, you'll be able to see most of the, the homes having own gardens, 
where they get their own uh, what they need to take and also sell out the surplus. And we encourage them to do their saving every fortnight, that is during the payday when they go out and sell their product. Even though they don't have any um, roofing for the to sell out their product, they just sell them um, wherever they are able to do. Uh, that is next to the Island Council. So that those who work, I open. And not only that, but the anti craft, all their knowledge and skills, we encourage them to work as a team. So we establish the women organization with the youth where they are able to come together, share their knowledge and experiences of life. And from there, that moves them forward and to be able to share their knowledge and skills. Um, I believe that is through the having this um, passion, it has empowered them to work and to act according to what they believe is for the future of their children. So they start the planting you are with the long term crops that will last them in case of um, to make them become resilient during the climate change um, impact in the islands and also counting um, COVID-19 is also part of what we are living now in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. What inspiring work you're doing. That was wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dorothy to come in now, please. Over to you, Dorothy. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. I hope you can hear me clearly as I'm wearing my mask to observe our COVID-19 protocol as I'm actually in our provincial cafeteria area. It's a public place. Thank you. <clears throat> I woke up to the stark reality of climate change when my community was affected with the onslaught of the potato late blood disease in 2002 and 2003. That actually brought the entire potato industry in the country to a halt. And it affected <clears throat> a 200 million kina industry in Papua New Guinea in the formal sector and a 500 million kina industry in the informal sector. And just about every community in the high altitude regions throughout Papua New Guinea were devastated when the potato late blight uh, spread throughout the country within 24 months. It was, it was in 2002, middle of 2002, just as the country was going into elections and nobody took notice of the onslaught of the potato late blight and it devastated the industry. When the new government came in, in 2003, it was late to actually address the issue. And my, my village, my family, my community was affected with food security problem. That reality got me on my knees to become a climate warrior and to be actively involved and engaged with the ground working committee as they were doing action research throughout the agriculture research stations in Papua New Guinea with the private sector to quickly attend <clears throat> to identify pragmatic solutions to revive the potato industry. So that was where I got, in, got myself uh, involved in becoming an active, active participant in reviving the potato industry in my country. Further to that, my interest in sustainable agriculture also um, got very much involved with my people back in Enga uh, in 2016 when I was engaged by the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade to work on a climate, adapta climate change adaptation strategies project. My task back then as the food security officer was to distribute seedlings and virus-free planting materials to the local farmers of Enya. 
through training and extension activities under the provincial food security program. Then in 2019, the Climate Resilient Green Growth Project implemented by GGGI in partnership with the Climate Change and Development Authority inspired and sparked my interest in green innovation. From then on, my humble journey to unlock the potential of green growth and development gained momentum. Hence, I was at the forefront of mainstreaming climate resilient green growth project together with our team in Enya province through <clears throat> my active participation as a current member of the Provincial Climate Change Committee and also as a participant in establishing the tripartite tri MOU between GGGI, Climate Change Development Authority and the Enya Provincial Government to support the implementation of the CRGG project. Ultimately, I played an instrumental role in the mainstreaming of climate resilient green growth <clears throat> in consultations uh, with our provincial planning co committee uh, when making considerations into the overall step up in a provincial development strategic plan 2022 to 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And it always amazes me when we're faced with such hardship, that's often when we as humans become so innovative and, and you know we just have to seek really innovative solutions. So thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm going to ask Vera to come in now to share her story. Thank you, Vera. Naka Helena and Mulivinaka um, everyone. A very happy uh, International Women's Day. <clears throat> uh, Value City was established 32 years ago by my parents. And the focus then uh, was due to the lack of affordable and trendy clothing in our uh, hometown in Lombasa. However, being from Fiji, and I'm sure other Pacific Islanders will agree with me, um, that we learned recycling from a very young age. Because we came from big families, uh, we went through the process of hand-me-downs much to the dismay of the younger siblings in the family. Our mothers uh, taught us during cooler months to rewear our clothing and PJs, no single wear washers so that uh, we could save on water and soap and the uh, good old elbow grease, because in those days there wasn't uh, many washing machines. Um, so unconsciously, we were learning the values of uh, reusing, reducing and uh, recycling. So just a bit on Value City, so we can understand why we went into more of upcycling and all to save uh, our environment. In Fiji, we employ over 200 staff, 70% of whom are women and our management team majority are women. And we also franchise to Tong and Kiribati. We import uh, in Fiji, around 1,560 tons annually of used clothing and re other related products, such as uh, bric-a-brac and household goods, books and shoes and toys. So in the business of pre-loved uh, clothing, we cannot sell 100% of what we bring in. And as our business grew, we realized the importance of uh, being environment friendly. So instead of dumping what we could not sell into our landfill, we had to be innovative on how to better manage our waste and reduce what went into the landfill from our unsold stock. So we thought of the impacts of climate change, of course, and especially for our small Pacific Islands and now more so, um, it should be an inspiration for us to uh, seriously consider our environment because we're getting uh, um, uh, category five cyclones. We've had two already, um, but uh, our journey started when uh, we realized that we did, did not want to uh, put uh, so much into landfill. So started our journey of green innovation and upcycling. So, Aside, of course, from our core business of uh, selling uh, recycled goods, 
we had to upcycle some of the goods that we could not sell. So what did we do to prevent this getting into the landfill? We, um, we wholesale to MSMEs, a lot of the ladies in villages or in a flea market or on roadside stalls, um, um, unsold garments uh, that uh, were reconstructed. So we made um, uh, shorts and uh, out of long pants and uh, long sleeve shirts and tops were made into short sleeves. Long dresses, ball dresses were made into cocktail dresses. And um, um, we plan uh, to make uh, denim uh, bags because now uh, Fiji has gone uh, plastic free in retail. So we are making uh, denim bags to be sold. Uh, these will be made out of uh, unsold skirts and pants. Um, We've had a few samples uh, come our way, so we are very eager to start on that. Uh, cotton garments, cotton stripped of, uh, of uh, zippers and buttons, and these are made into cotton rags. And these rags are sold to heavy industries like our mills and our uh, mines, the shipping companies, and uh, even for domestic use, we have uh, uh, mothers who come and buy uh, cotton rags to use at home. Um, broken uh, glass and jewelry, broken uh, jewelry. Uh, some of the local jewelry makers come and buy them and uh, go off and make their own little beads and bracelets. And uh, the buttons and zippers that we strip for rags, we give them to uh, women's groups that they can uh, use. Uh, broken glass and crockery, uh, the mosaic art creators, they come and collect them so that uh, all of these do not uh, end up uh, in our landfill. So um, uh, our CSR, we have um, a donation of, uh, uh, of uh, bales of clothing to our um, uh, aged, uh, home for the aged. We uh, give a lot for the uh, cyclone relief efforts. We have, um, some going to whoever whoever seeks uh, uh, clothing, we give those for unsold books and toys, uh, teaching aids, whatever that can be used in schools. These are given to um, the ECEs, primary schools, um, and these are used up there. So um, that's our green innovation um, uh, that we have done with our business uh, to try and. Uh, uh, keep a friendly, be friendly to our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. That's really fantastic and so inspiring for other corporates as well. It also made me think about my grandmother who co-raised me. Um, and she was, uh, she was a nurse during the Second World War, but she always raised me to make food last. And, you know, I use every single bit of food. I, I cannot stand to, to throw food away. Um, but I think what you've said is that our ancestors actually, you know, much of it is, 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 is doing what they taught us. They had to be very careful um, and we need to be careful perhaps for different reasons, um, but it's all for, for the planet and, and it makes so much sense. So thank you. I just, I find that very inspiring. Thank you. Thank I'm you. going to uh, <laughs> go to Tuiloma. Tuiloma, please share your story. I hope I don't cry. I'm just, I get very emotional when I get moved. So <laughs> don't worry. That's why I, I, I embrace it. I think it's part of my strength. We can be women and we can be moved. Over to you, to Aloma. So Loma, are you ready to give us your story? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. I didn't realize it was me that you were calling on. Here's me calling. On. It's a pleasure to, to be here with everybody. Um, I'm honored to be invited to be alongside such a prestigious panel. Um, I'm going to get right into it. So I didn't realize it was me that was being called on. Thank you. It's been inspirational so far. Those who have shared 
thank you for your stories, the very real impacts um, to climate change in the countries that you were, you know, when you started our last speaker saying, um, Vera, you say, I woke up to it. Uh, that's very, that's something that, that, that impacts you straight away. My personal experience is primarily in the entrepreneurship aspect of green innovation um, and the challenges faced by women in terms of firstly, equitable opportunities as um, you rightly put in, in uh, when setting the scene in the, after the video that we saw and the shifting of mindsets towards green innovation. Uh, because to be frankly honest, that is a concept that does not come naturally to business owners. Um, so that's that's where, where our work comes in. And here at the Samo Business Hub, and that is where uh, my hat as the, the, the chair of the Samo Business Hub is where most of our work comes in. We encourage the green component of businesses. And whether this is in the supply chain or, or in business processes, or even the final product development, including their packaging, on the flip side as well as an organization that supports business, uh, the Samo Business Hub does not then support any business activity that can cause harm to the environment. So in, in that sense, that's how we choose to, to advocate. Um, as such, however, the Samo Business Hub then works with local, regional and international partners because we then need to recognize that to be able to do this effectively, we need to ensure that our own teams have the knowledge, um, the skill and the capacity to support green innovation proposals um, from clients that, 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 that do pass through and that we have to support. Um, it's, it's important and we've taken a lot of time to ensure that our own team have this knowledge. And that's where our partnership with our Global Green Growth Institute comes in. And, and, other, and other international organizations. Um, so with GGGI, we partner to deliver the Pacific Green Entrepreneurship Network Program. And we found on the ground, being a partner to that, um, that that supports women and, and youth entrepreneurs, but it's to develop those business models that just make them uh, see the opportunities or make them think twice about developing business models, yes, to be sustainable, but also include solutions that they can contribute uh, to their national climate and sustainable development goals. And so in, in that sense, we do a lot of work in the changing of mindsets. In the agribusiness sector, for example, uh, the opportunities for micro enterprises are definitely there uh, here in Samoa and across the Pacific. Um, the, the hub, as we are known today, we. Uh, if, we can, if I can talk a little bit about it, the Samoa Business Hub was established in 1994. So some 28 years ago, we were called the SPEC or the Samoa Business Enterprise Center. And we were supported primarily by the government of New Zealand, uh, who have been a, a great partner, but they have remained the partner for this uh, initiative for nearly three decades now. And we started off as a loan guarantee scheme uh, established to facilitate access to finance as you mentioned in, in the introduction, but mostly for small, medium, micro enterprises, SMEs as they're known. We acknowledge that the access to finance for micro enterprises who were, and most of which were being run by women uh, in the Pacific and definitely here in Samoa, um, over 90% of small businesses are here in Samoa. And I know that that is also the number for most of the small of Pacific Islands are run by family, they're family run businesses. So of course the role of women there um, is, is not only in driving uh, businesses, but also um, in being the backbone of a lot of the small micro enterprises that, that do exist. And so there was an acknowledgement that access to finance will always be a challenge for micro enterprises. And we can't talk about um, green innovation if the innovative entrepreneurs are just not able to access finance. And that is because, you know, we just, it's facilitating the collateral we, in, in, in Samoa, uh, over 80% of the land is customary land. So there's gonna be no opportunity to pan that over as collateral for banks as required for a small business loan. We were rebranded to the Samoa Business Hub because from the outset, this work is never about just the financial side of things. We found that it was, we were more involved in the business support side of things, the business planning, the budgets, the supply chains, the access to markets. But the mentoring part then of course is where green innovation came in 
and the recognition of opportunities in the agriculture sector, for example, um, that could be linked to green growth projects. Um, and, and so that's where a lot of our work has been. Um, and we also then find, and for our panel here, I'd like to bring in the point of this, in working in this space, um, most of our experience is to recognize um, that there are challenges that are cultural norms and cultural expectations on the roles and responsibilities of women. And of course, in areas like domestic and inter intimate partner violence that we cannot ignore when we're supporting uh, innovative green innovation or we're supporting any micro enterprise for that matter, or, uh, women driven enterprises. We just simply can't ignore that on the social side, there are some very real uh, social and gender inequality issues that do exist. And so our role at the, at the Sangha Business Hub is to provide to policy, policy engagement uh, discussions, that side of things, that yes, there is the enabling business environment that we are constantly needing to, to, to make sure that it is improved upon and that inherent risks that women entrepreneurs face not only to start a business, but ensure its growth and sustainability are also encompassed with social and gender inequality issues um, that do exist and do impact them on a daily basis. Um, all of that today, I'd like to, to, to close here by saying that all of that today means a completely different thing to what it was three years ago. No business analyst and no business forecast specialist could have ever predicted the drastic shift in business environments um, that the whole world has had to adapt to today with uh, you know, the, the, the global pandemic and border closures, spikes to, to fuel costs, uh, record inflation rates, and, and those types of things that are going, going to continue to impact uh, on women, and especially women in the, what I call the front line of businesses, especially micro enterprises, uh, they have we just spoke about the social inherent risks that they that they face being women, the inequalities that exist. And now in this particular environment, unprecedented times, we have others. So our work here at the Summer Business Hub is to, is to mentor our clients um, through that, adapting them through these challenges, uh, making sure that, that, that their, their journey is focused. Uh, you know, it's, it's about facilitating access to finance. So you know, we, we, we have to deal with, with all of that now and, and, and ensure that the non-performing loans levels don't get high up uh, too much and get out of, out, of, out of control. However, so, so I guess to, to the discussion, I, 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 our experiences and my, my sharing today it hopes to be that, um, you know, green innovation is something that comes naturally to Pacific women uh, where the concept of organic, for example, organic farming is, is, is not a concept that, that's new because it is what we, what is, it's all we know. When entire islands are organically certified and, and we partner with, with uh, women in business, for example, who do this work in Samoa, that presents a whole nother level of opportunities uh, for micro enterprises to move into green innovation. And, and so, um, you know, our role is, is encompassed in that, in, in all of those, those different areas, not just in finance, uh, in business growth, but also the social impacts and, of course, the impacts of, of the world today. Thank you. Tim and Loma, you've said many important things there, but one thing I would like to just emphasize is having your own income, <laughs> being your own entrepreneur, but women being their, their own income earners enables them to leave abusive relationships sometimes, and that's been my personal experience. Um, I had a very interesting discussion with a very powerful woman once, and I was in a very difficult relationship. And she said, what are more important, your children or your job? And I said, oh, well, my children. She said, no, it's actually your job. Because if you don't have your job, you can't get your children out of this situation. So it's just very powerful what we're talking about today. And I think there's some sensitive issues being raised, um, which is a good thing. OK, um, thank you again. Um, can I ask uh, Lucia to tell us your story, please? Thank you. Thank you, Helena. I can hear you, over to you. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day to all our uh, fellow 
panelists and our participants today from around the Pacific. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, um, to be invited to be part of this. And I'm glad that um, Helena has uh, earlier mentioned that she can get a bit emotional sometimes. I am too. So please forgive me if I um, drop a tear every now and then. But um, just, just to, to share a bit of uh, our story from Tonga, uh, I would like to just uh, talk about the current organization that I'm currently running here, uh, which is uh, Tonga Youth Employment and Entrepreneurship, or TYEE. -E. Um, and as Helena has mentioned uh, earlier through the introductions, uh, we help uh, young school leaders um, to get into jobs, to consider jobs uh, through entrepreneurship. How do we uh, get that into this uh, green space? Uh, I'll just go back uh, a couple of years uh, before going in space. 2000. And uh, he was established as a, a youth support station, uh, AO. Um, the people uh, through uh, the program here, uh, and that is work readiness skills development, and then supporting to uh, employment placements. And uh, the alternative to uh, the very minimal. Uh, uh, job uh, availability here. Uh, we uh, factor in entrepreneurship as our vehicle to um, promote and encourage young people to consider that as a career pathway uh, as they uh, come out of school. Um, just to give you a bit of a, a statistics in Tonga, you know, there's about uh, 2,000 young people coming out of school each year to about 200 to 300 jobs. So when you do the maths uh, year after year, you, you've got to ask the question of what are the rest of young people doing if they are not able to uh, secure those uh, available opportunities. And that is when we had to be uh, innovative as, uh, as an organization. We had to come up with this uh, that uh, in um, considering the or who uh, are for us, generations uh, before, thinking uh, had to be, has to be innovative, it has to be unique. And that's when uh, we sort of see ourselves, you know, we, we may be a small organization in school to making the transition to employment and business. Uh, we uh, came up with the idea of, uh, or the concept of uh, creating a one-stop shop. Uh, and that is to uh, whatever the, the young uh, school leavers uh, want help with, uh, want the support for uh, in terms of moving them from uh, uh, not getting a job to getting a job or uh, leaving school to uh, securing a, a job. We had to build that into our, to our business process and model so that uh, when they enter our door, they'll have everything in there that they need. And uh, when they exit our door, it means they will uh, reach that goal of why they came to us in the first place, and that is to secure a job. Uh, we also uh, uh, apply that same concept to the businesses because at the end of the day, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the, the support of our local business. So we partner up with uh, about 85% of the businesses in Tonga, and that includes some of the government ministries to support uh, the young people who uh, come through our program uh, to, to have access to those uh, employment opportunities. So um, we also apply that to businesses when they need to hire their new staff, uh, whether it's individual or whether as a team, uh, they come to us and we uh, give them that say one-stop shop approach. Uh, you submit to us your vacancy and you tell us uh, all the requirements you need and then we do the rest for you. So we saw it as an, uh, a, a service of convenience, um, you know, uh, living uh, here on the, on the small island like Tonga. Uh, if you go uh, look for something uh, at the shop, you may have to go to 10 different shops before you find them. 
So it's not like uh, overseas where you walk into one supermarket and you find it all in one shop. So we, we try to uh, apply the, the supermarket type model into, into our services. So that when employers come in, uh, we do everything within uh, our center to support them in securing their, uh, you know, good quality work ready candidates. So um, one of uh, or some of the challenges that young people face when they come through is the frustration of not getting jobs or just the, the, the lack of uh, work experience or just, the, you know, uh, no real self uh, confidence and also just the, the relevant skills to, to secure a job. So uh, with that in mind, uh, especially for the work experience, we find that year after year, young people will continue to be uh, missing out of, of some of these opportunities because of those, uh, of those um, lacking of uh, experience, uh, the skills, and also just, just to build up their confidence so that they can face the, the world of work. Um, so we had to once again go back to our innovative space and try to, to come with, an, uh, with a solution to how we can better support and add value to our service processes, but also to young people and the businesses that they will go to. So part of, of the, the bigger ask from the youth is work experience. Please give us some work experience. And how can we gain work experience if we are not given a job or given a chance? So in our little uh, small space, uh, we uh, created a platform uh, that we call Go Green uh, Initiative. It's a youth-led community initiative focusing on uh, recycling clothes, which is, uh, uh, I was so excited to hear uh, Vera and her uh, Value City business. And I'm also glad to learn more about that because we have uh, Value City here. Value City is also, uh, a very supportive employer of TYE. Uh, they hire some of their staff from us and majority girls. So um, that Go Green platform that we establish uh, is directly um, aligning with our, uh, our keen interest to start remodeling our business model so that we can factor in the need to educate our young people to learn more about uh, why we do certain things to contribute to climate change, or why do we do recycling? Why clothes? Why can't be uh, just anything, plastic and all that? But uh, it's a small organization. We gotta start somewhere with one thing. So clothing recycling is uh, a, a, a small project that we uh, engage the youth to, to come and practice their skills and then they uh, recycle clothes through uh, other initiatives, uh, swap or exchange. And uh, we, we drive that, that project with the concept that it has to be um, affordable for the youth to recycle clothes. It has to be, uh, you know, it has to help the environment by reducing clothing waste that goes into the landfill and also ensuring that it's gonna be uh, a sustainable uh, approach to, um, to the recycling industry or the waste industry. So that's, that's how we uh, found ourselves arriving at the, the green space, uh, innovation uh, green space. And um, I must say that uh, I think what I, I experienced in the early days uh, we didn't take the green innovation uh, seriously. And I think also because there was a lack of uh, uh, education in that uh, area, um, you know, um, not so much information that was available to us. So it was until last year uh, that the youth uh, policy, the Tonga National Youth Policy was launched and it highlighted the, the core uh, uh, area of priorities for Tonga and the youth sector to focus on. And that's when we realize if we want to take this seriously and if we want to commit to this uh, contribution to our environment and to climate change, we need to really look at how we are going uh, to innovate in this space of, uh, of green business, green entrepreneurship, because that's where we see uh, the way forward for us. And, and like uh, our panelists from uh, Samoa, 
we have to uh, start looking at how we uh, design our business model. Uh, we have to look at how we can develop our business, our existing business model, so that we can factor in some of the green um, business, uh, the innovation, uh, whether it's through the processing, whether it's through the final product, or however way you see fit to your business. But I think for young people, they are the future. Lucia, yeah, wonderful. And it's just so great to hear what you're doing and to empower so many people. But you're absolutely right. It being The green element starts right at concept development, right in terms of the business model and the composition of the team and goes forward from there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask Rebecca now to tell your story. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. Can you hear me? Can hear you clearly. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for the warm welcome. And I'm so excited to share my story. I came into this space accidentally. Um, I started off as a career economist within the Ministry of Trade. And after I finished my PhD and I returned to Vanuatu, I did not make it back into government. Um, so what I did was I repackaged my skill sets and started applying to other opportunities. And I've been in the project management space for the past eight years. And it's been such an inspiration working with different women and communities here. I'd like to talk today about my experience in two specific projects um, that I've worked in in my career. And you would have heard Helena talk about in the introduction. Um, the first one is the family farms approach being implemented by the Farm Plus program here in Vanuatu. Um, and shout out to Emily and Tawasi um, who are leading the program here in Vanuatu. I left 10 months ago, but they're still um, here in the field doing amazing, amazing work. And I hope that in this um, time, probably during the question and answer session, I will talk about the amazing work that they're doing. Um, but first of all, for our introduction, I'd like to talk about what we're doing here at the Vanuatu Business Resilience Council um, and probably providing another angle to what Tuiloma has spoken um, beautifully about what they're doing at the Samoa Business Hub. Um, and so um, we're currently implementing a project here called the Phoenix Women in Business Project. Um, and the normal practice in entrepreneurship projects and programs has been to um, use a particular pot of funding um, to try and benefit as many beneficiaries as possible because it looks good on paper. Um, however, this is not practical or sustainable. Um, and what we tried to do when we designed the Phoenix Women in Business project um, was to take a different approach. We decided to provide targeted support to only 10 strong female owned SME owners over a 12 month period. And the support we provided include business management training, business continuity planning, leadership training, um, coaching and mentoring, and finally seed funding up to $10,000 um, based on a weighted matrix um, on how they performed um, throughout the project training. The results have been really positive um, and I've been really inspired working with these women, meeting them and hearing their stories. Um, we've seen women business owners being more confident and maintaining their business during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a big thing uh, for a small SME. Uh, we've seen improved business management skills, especially in writing a fully fledged business plan. Um, in cash flow recording, profit and loss statements, um, and stronger marketing over social media platforms and client retention. We've seen higher sustainability of business um, during this new normal um, with a very strong tendency to pivot and use the new skills that they have learned um, to introduce new products or services, strengthening their business model further and strengthening their sustainability and resilience also. The big um, take on this is that 
Strengthening women in business requires a targeted approach, um, such as what we've introduced, um, because just because women wear so many hats, they're our wife, they're a mother, um, they're a career woman, they're a community member, and then they're a businesswoman. And so just trying to juggle all these different hats, um, you know, it takes a lot of strength and resilience. And it's so heartwarming to see the successes of these um, women, these 10 women, and through what we've introduced and through what we've learned. And at the moment, we're looking forward to scaling them up in other projects. If there's time, I'd like to talk about the Farmer Plus program and their innovative approach and in family farms. Um, yeah, so let me know if there's time and I can talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, so much. Again, amazing work you're doing and, and all these uh, entrepreneurs you're sending out into the world. It's great to hear. Um, we're going to. We, I want to keep to time um, and we do want to keep some time for audience questions as well. Um, so I'm going to ask the panelists just um, a few questions and if you can just give really succinct answers that would be great, maybe just keeping it to about a minute um, and then we'll go into the audience questions, okay? Um, so I'm going to ask Anna and Dorothy the same question. How do you personally define green innovation or entrepreneurship and what role do you think culture and gender play in innovation? That sounds like quite a hard question to me. I will be interested to know your answers. <laughs> Anna, um, over to you and then Dorothy, please. Um, okay, thank you. Just looking at a question. Uh, with the question you have, like um, uh, asking of what the green innovation is, um, like for me, my own or, um, definition of green innovation is that it derives from the uh, from the econo environmental issues that are faced nowadays, and that is dealing with the climate change as well. That's where I'm more uh, focused on, and because Kiribati is one of the islands I believe is at the front line of climate change impacts. And with that, we believe that um, it is important for us to put in our culture. We see culture as an identity. And so culture, the cultural values are very important for us where we are trying to merge our, our traditional knowledge with the modern technology to try and help on how to um, solve the issues we are in, especially the problems. And knowing that here in Kiribati, um, it is a more male dominated um, culture. As a youth and as a gender and youth officer, it is one of my core role to try and uh, make sure to mainstream and uh, the, to, to do the mainstreaming in all the project activities we are doing now. So what is important about uh, um, the, the, the important role that China is playing in the role of um, the, the green innovation is that as a mother, believing that like we call the earth our mother and mothers are the only people who, have, who are more passionate and have a heart to give and to do the work that they wish um, to make sure that all their children are safe and have all their means in, in, live, in life. So I believe they play a very important role whereby they are able to give in all the energies into the project they are doing, like what they are doing in the outer islands, we are working in, in the nine islands. These women who have been, uh, I, I always call them, they were in their shell nuts before, but when the time comes, we were able to go and have a talk with them, a face-to-face -face visiting them in their homes, that is when it is like we are cracking the nuts and that when they swim out from their nuts and are able to share all the knowledge that they have as well, because we believe that they, they don't know anything and that they are not important. But we, in actual fact, they are playing a very important role in the family. And that brings in with the, what they have, the knowledge and the skills they have in, the, in their own. So from there, we take them out and um, trying to mainstream and make sure that this is a, a gender equity. We trained in our project, everyone is encouraged to be trained and that no one is left behind. 
making sure that all the skills and knowledge we share to the islanders, all women, youth, children, and disabled are able to have those. And from them, they were able to run their own show. Like now they are able to run their own markets, the women, they were on the top of the marketing during the two weeks, as we have mentioned before. So that is where I believe we it is important for women's role. They have played a crucial role in this um, green innovation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. So women take, take it into the home and they're also great mobilizers. Um, Dorothy, can I have your take on this question, please? What's your definition of innovation or entrepreneurship and... How does gender or culture play a role? Thank you. Thank you. My definition for green innovation or entrepreneurship is based on, is defined by my work practice. And that is maintaining an eco-friendly approach to farming developing these farming practices and transferring the skills or imparting them through trainings into the farming communities. And my focus has been over the last uh, 14 years on increasing potato yields using new and improved farming practices that are eco-friendly. Um, apart from that, I also, through my networks, in the Enya Provincial Administration in our 17 local level government areas and our 358 wards, conduct trainings and awareness, particularly targeting youth, women, um, people living with disability, people living with HIV and AIDS and the vulnerable people in our community such as widows and orphans um, from uh, communities or from families that have uh, left behind, especially very young children from parents who have died from HIV and AIDS. So we also give very special focus and attention to these um, special people in our communities. And we encourage them to actually um, go into using clean gas, clean energy, um, and also to harvest charcoal from the deep forest, from whole fell, uh, fallen trees, to use charcoals rather than cutting down trees. Then we also encourage them to um, use solar panels for lightings in the house, for children to study for um, tests and also do their homeworks using solar panels and to charge their mobile phones back in the rural and remote rural communities. So that is my definition for green innovation. Um, and very much in the forefront to discourage use of a generator or other uh, equipment that um, emit greenhouse gases. And most importantly, not to burn forest and burn grassland. So yeah, that's basically how I define green innovation in my work practice in terms of entrepreneurship. Dorothy, I think I'm going, to, I'm going to have to just move on to, to give other people a chance to answer questions, but you gave a wonderful definition of, of green in innovation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. But let me move on to Vera and to Aloma, please. And I'd like to thank ask you. you these questions. Thank you, thank you, Dorothy, that was wonderful. Um, so for Vera and to Aloma, can I ask, what did you wish you knew at the beginning of your green entrepreneurship journey, especially as a woman entering the space? Thank you. Vera first and then to Aloma, please. Okay, thank you, Helena. Um, like I said, uh, my parents, uh, in their wisdom, sowed the seed of uh, entrepreneurship 32 years ago, but uh, I don't think they realized they were getting into green entrepreneurship. And um, if only, you know, it's greatly impacted the business now and how we can uh, advocate to our customers and uh, on the importance of recycling, not only in Fiji, as we've also spread out to the Pacific. And today uh, we hear of eco-friendly, we hear of uh, caring for our environment, climate change, a big issue, and going green. 
so I took over the managing uh, director uh, post some 18 years ago. Um, I joined the business one year after it was established. And uh, I had to work hard, not only in getting the three R message across, but to be accepted and respected as a successful entrepreneur as I was uh, ent entering um, predominantly male uh, space. So our biggest challenge by far uh, was to change the mindset and the stigma that was associated with uh, buying uh, secondhand. So 30 years ago in Fiji, uh, one would be frowned upon or looked down on for entering a thrift store, let alone buying, uh, you know, somebody else's used uh, stuff. So how did we overcome this? And uh, so we put strong quality control measures in place uh, to lift the quality of uh, and the standard of recycled products that were entering Fiji from overseas so that, you know, we weren't bringing in um, uh, rubbish to raise the standard of presentation and service in this space. And of course, uh, quality and um, affordability was very important. Um, advocating the importance of recycling, reusing and reducing. And then, uh, you know, we can safely say that we have customers now from across the whole community. And uh, as we've come a, um, a household name now. So we have, um, we still have a lot of work to be done here at home. We still need to preach to the unconverted, uh, to care about our environment and climate change, more so now with uh, what's happening with climate change, and to take ownership. We need to take ownership of our clothing and our H2O footprint. Um, one just has to look up how much is put into the fashion industry in terms of water usage. So as seriously as we consider the impact of our uh, clothing and H2O uh, footprint, hopefully we will be able to turn more, uh, more of the population into using uh, recycled goods and pre-loved fashion. For the region, I've already uh, got uh, interest uh, from uh, some in the region that uh, we will try to reach out and take our business uh, model to more Pacific Island nations, because then we will be um, teaching uh, more people to recycle. Um, I just have to add here that uh, we, we like to, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, look at who inspires us. But I think us as mothers, me as a mother, as a grandmother, I would like to inspire my children and grandchildren uh, to live a safe and uh, healthier earth for their generations to come. I'm now teaching my, my grandchildren what my grandmother taught me, you know, like how to save, um, don't do a single wash of clothing. Everything we have is recycled in the home, our clothing. So in doing so, I would like to also set up something, a venture or a program or a project that will reach out to young children and teach them the values and the importance of recycling. And uh, in doing so, I think we, if we, if we uh, target them at a young age, I know that they will, uh, they will learn young and uh, leave a better earth for, for their generations to come. Um, I think that- Aaron. Thank you. It's almost like a new initiative is being suggested right now. So yeah. I hope that what comes out of today is, is, is even bigger than what we came in with. <laughs> Thank you again. To Aloma, can I hand over to you for, for a short response, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, not knowing what you don't know. <laughs> that, that's an ongoing challenge to women entrepreneurs from all sectors and in all sizes of business innovation. I, I too was brought up in a, in a, in a family run business. Uh, so, you know, I can relate also to Vera. However, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift us to, to something that I wish, like that is like the question has been posed. What do you wish you had known? And I wanna shift us a little bit away and I will be brief. When two out of three women 
face intimate partner violence. And the number for Samoa is around 86, 87%. That we cannot deny that while women are trying to run a business, or as, you, as you've said, um, Madam Moderator, while women are trying to earn an income for their children, then that number that we have across the Pacific and certainly is, is, is pre prevalent here in Samoa, it means that two out of three women, while they are running a business, while they are earning incomes for their families and children, and what feels like everyone else in the community that they're, that they're helping, are also faced with abuse, and continue to live in fear of violence. Um, what, what many don't know about intimate partner violence is that it's a three-stage cycle. And in between the explosion or the incident um, of violence, which is what a lot of us then hear about, um, in between that is uh, the stage of uh, the build-up stage and the, the honeymoon stage. So in this three-stage approach, I'll talk to you very briefly, there's the, there's the honeymoon stage because after the explosion, there's a honeymoon stage and that's why women stay. But then there's this build-up stage, this con constant walking on eggshells to avoid the explosion, the constant the tiptoeing uh, and living in fear. Why are we doing this as women? Is because we want to avoid the explosive stage that we've been through, this is the cycle. And so in that stage, we're protecting our children from the explosion. We're doing anything our abuser wants to, to avoid having him into the, the explosion stage of, of, of living in, in violence. And that stage includes acting in ways that will please the abuser at all costs, right? To protect the children from violence, to protect yourself from another violent outburst. My learning that, that I'd like to share in, in, in I wish I had known then as an entrepreneur, is I wish I'd known more about these stages that I went then after uh, 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 you know, leaving the, the relationship and, and, and the divorce. I went and studied it, became a research fellow in it, but I didn't know any of this in, in 12 years that we'd run a, a business together as an entrepreneur. Um, I wish I had known then because um, when I look back, I, I cannot understand how possibly I did it. And I can't understand today how women live in, in, in running businesses and live in these types of relationships. And so many of our women across the Pacific continue to do so. They continue to be abused and get up in the morning, chuck a hat on if you're here, if you, you know, put makeup on, try and look like you haven't been abused and just keep moving and just keep moving and just keep moving forward, just keep doing what they do. And looking back, I now recognize how much negative impact uh, not knowing, not understanding enough about my situation had on the business environment that I had created, had on the running of a business, um, and how much impact that had on also your children, because you're running it as a family-run business, but how much impact that also had on yourself as a woman. And I'd like to share that what it does is it hinders your productivity. Um, it makes you less innovative, as we talk about, about innovation in, in, in this discussion. And, and your, that dynamic entrepreneur personality uh, is stunted, um, which is why I, I sort of mentioned that, that, that you know, some women uh, grow up in business. However, you start to even question yourself. You start to question your own skill and knowledge um, as an entrepreneur when you're in such a relationship because you're, you know, the, the constant uh, put downs, the constant uh, abuses is often around the area of criticism uh, telling you, you know, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're fat, you're ugly. And so when, when women are constantly, we have to remember that when we see um, successful women entrepreneurs, and that's where I'm at now, I now um, through the hub can see women just rocking it and being so fantastic at, at, at achieving so much. I still think and remember that two out of three of them are facing a challenge that they're never going to talk about and that we don't talk about enough that two or three of them are, are coming out of the, doing this despite all the abuse, despite all the negativity, and despite the walking on eggshells and tiptoe living in, in such a relationship. So that, that, that's my, I wish I'd known more about back then, yeah. That is so powerful and it's so true. I just want to say to all the women, because I'm going to have to hand over to Esther now, we're, we're, we're rapidly getting to the end of our time. Maybe some people can come go over the, the time, but I'm not able to. 
but you've said so so much that's powerful and every panelist has said so much that's powerful the numbers that you quote the 86 87 percent of Samoan women living in abusive relationships that you know it's so high that is the norm of the of the women in I mean it's just it's so striking I know that the, the statistics across the Pacific are quite high I guess my message to women having been in this same situation and even if you're in a very supportive relationship is just never underestimate your potential um, we can do so much we can achieve so much in life we have to do it for ourselves we have to do it for our children we must honor ourselves um, we by honoring ourselves we honor our children and we honor our communities but also to go green to save our planet it cannot be done without women you know women are the best mobilizers for every one person that a man brings along women will bring 15 people along they are phenomenal mobilizers um, the innovation we bring the bring it into the home the educating our children you know it is so powerful what we do in every facet of, of us as as being women um, so I just want people to just just you know be proud of yourself. Give yourself a pat on the back. We don't say thank you to ourselves enough. So thank you to you all. I'm going to hand over to Esther. Esther, you've been amazing. Um, I really appreciate you inviting me here today with such powerful women and a wonderful audience as well. And, and you are all change agents. We're all change agents in the world and we're going to make the world the place we want to live in. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Handing back to Esther. Okay, bye. Thank you so much, Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Helena. You've done a wonderful job, and I know it's really hard to keep your answers concise. And there's really so much to talk about on this topic. Um, and I, I can see that we have some we've had some questions in the in the Q and A, um, and I think a number of them have been answered. Uh, I know if I think if we could, I know we've just got a couple of minutes left, so I think perhaps um, if we could just very briefly, Lucia, if I could ask you. Just very briefly, um, just give us your, I mean, you know, we all know that uh, Tonga, I mean, it's, it's wonderful that we can actually have you here today. Obviously, uh, and now that we use the word unprecedented a lot <laughs> these days with COVID, but also unfortunately with the, uh, the natural disasters that have um, impacted Tonga as well. Um, I wondered if you could just briefly give us your, um, you know, a minute or, or less, um, you know, reflect on the the impacts of climate change and the disasters that you've seen, particularly in Tonga. And you know, what do you see as the opportunities from green innovation? If you could just very briefly give us some words on that. Thank you, Peter. Um, just briefly, um, I think uh, when we talk about opportunities for women, uh, you know, isn't you know, after a disaster uh, like the, the recent uh, disasters we've gone through. I think one thing that's important also uh, recognized is that for women to be able to, uh, you know, reach their potentials to uh, also be part of uh, the opportunities that they are seeking is uh, our Samoa panelists has touched base on is allowing whether women are being supported and allowed to be engaged and involved in that space uh, of green business and uh, innovation. And I think it comes down to the attitude of our, of our Pacific women. You know, uh, there's so much opportunities for women uh, to become innovators, uh, in entrepreneurs, educators, policy makers, you name it, the list goes on. But then, uh, you know, with, with our uh, uh, island mentality and attitude, I think, to be role models to our young generations, we need to be at the forefront of the change and the change needs to start with us. It has to start with our uh, own way of thinking, our own uh, mentality, attitude towards uh, business, towards environment, towards opportunity and money and so forth. So, you know, it also goes to, to say that uh, with that in mind, we also need to look at what's hindering women from reaching opportunities. And that's uh, the idea of education comes in. Women can be educators as an opportunity for them uh, at, at times of crisis. 
or women in general can be educated about uh, innovation, about green business, about entrepreneurship, uh, you know, about creating and maintaining sustainable businesses. Uh, so there's so much opportunity in there for women to tap into, but we've got to have the right attitude. We've got to have the right mindset to go into these opportunities with, uh, if we want to continue to give hope to our future generations and the people behind us. I think that's, uh, you know, there's so much that I can touch based on like uh, the advantage and the opportunity that technology is bringing into our uh, space at the same time. Uh, there's so much that women can uh, tap into uh, in this field, uh, you know, whether it's through production. And uh, just to give you a quick example of that, uh, with the aid that has been pouring into Tonga uh, uh, due to the aftermath of the disasters, uh, most of the gifts or the, the donations were in the form of plastics. So it's a single use plastic, right? Plastic bags, plastic bottles, any, uh, the list goes on. So the aid is great, but then what can we do to, uh, you know, minimize the harm to our environment when we have that load of plastics? So Australia also offered to um, use their equipment to crush these plastic bottles and, and take it back to Australia. So I'm sure they have a big production there for, for that side of the industry. So there is an opportunity that women need to take the initiative and get into, you know, uh, within the recycling in industry to, um, to create more opportunities for others. But I better stop there, uh, Esther, because I know the time is uh, limited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luciana. That's really, really your words there are really helpful. Um, and just maybe just on the, uh, to hear from our final panelist again, Rebecca, certainly last but not, not least here. Um, it, would you mind closing off with the panel with some, some, quest, um, some thoughts, I guess, if you can think of um, advice for you know, aspiring women entrepreneurs and innovators, um, and particularly if you can think about what are the opportunities you see there and, and the role that you see women taking. Um, it's a very quick answer, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Esther. It looks like you've rolled two questions into one there. Um, so very quickly, um, advice for entrepreneurs, up and coming entrepreneurs. Um, so three bits of advice. Firstly, know what you want um, to achieve. And then um, secondly, identify who can support you or assist you in your journey. And then thirdly, look to reach out, network, knock on those doors until those doors open for you. Um, just very quickly, um, considering the impact of climate change and disasters in the Pacific at the moment, just wanted to make a quick comment, um, especially for Vanuatu, Tonga and Solomon Islands being classified as very risky countries um, based on the impacts of natural disasters. Um, within the project management space and given the ongoing water lockdowns, there is a shortage of project management specialists at the moment in the Pacific Islands. And so I see women taking more leading roles in this space, in the climate change, disaster risk reduction space. We are from here, we speak the language, we understand the culture, we have the relationships and networks, and we have the technical and management skills. We are the experts, so stand up, put your hand up for these opportunities. And this is how one way that you can make a change by leading and implementing these projects to contribute to resilience and the green innovation um, journey in, the, in our respective countries. Thank you for having me today, Esther. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I mean, that's a wonderful way to round out the panel, isn't it? I mean, absolutely, we all have a different role to play and the, the, the importance of, of having, you know, the local knowledge and that understanding of the context and the, the problems and what needs to be done is just um, absolutely um, so important. And, you know, back yourself um, and, and, and go out there and, and, and make the difference um, that you can make. Um, so absolutely, I totally agree with everything. Well, thank you so much to our panel. I, I think um, you know, I'd love to spend more time with all of you, but unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. And in fact, we're a few minutes over, so I do apologize for that. Um, but it's just, it's, uh, you know, you don't want to cut off for such amazing answers um, as, as we're getting from our, our panelists and all that very passionate, um, you know, heartfelt um, and, and such a range of topics that have been covered today. So um, I just will just very, very briefly mention um, 
like one upcoming thing just for, for our program and then we can uh, I'll pass over to my colleague, colleague Rashika to, to wrap us up for today. Um, as you might have seen in the chat already, I have just shared a link to a Google form and I will share it again as well um, and would appreciate if you can just take a, it should only take a minute or two um, to complete. Um, and, and the purpose of that is if you can, if you're interested to join our future networking events, we'd absolutely love to have you join us. Um, so basically where to from today, you know, we've, um, I hope you've been inspired, I certainly have been after, after our panel. Um, and we know, as I think as, as Helena mentioned, you know, with, with women, um, we're, we really uh, are more generally, we naturally network and, and connect with, with others um, more, more so. Um, perhaps in our male counterparts overall. I'd really love to keep this momentum going um, and then have a chance for you know, our wonderful audience who've been really active on the chat, which is wonderful. We'd love for you guys all to connect with each other, to connect um, and to share um, your experiences because a wealth of knowledge in, in, this, um, in this group is amazing. Not just the panel, which is amazing in itself, but, but beyond that to all the participants we have here today. So we're, uh, I'd like to just mention that we're starting an initiative, which we're branding uh, the Talanoa Tuesday. Um, and we thought we'd host just some virtual online Zoom, very informal networking uh, events where you can just sign up um, and join us on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, so starting from first Tuesday in April, which is the 5th of April. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have it around a sector or a theme. And so if you can let us know which themes would, um, would be uh, appropriate for you um, and that you'd like to join on, uh, join us on, we will uh, we'll definitely uh, let you know. And really, it'll just be very informal. We really just want you um, to give, a, give an opportunity for people to connect and, and learn from each other and support each other. Um, so that's all from me. Um, and now I will pass over to Rashika just to say a vote of thanks and close us off. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. So I'm very sure you all have had a very wonderful session today and enjoyed listening and learning a lot from our inspiring panelists from the Pacific region. And uh, this brings me to the um, special moment of thanking all those who have contributed to this wonderful session. So on behalf of the BGI and the Pacific Green Entrepreneurs Network team, which is Esther and I, uh, I'd like to call the Hill Appreciation to our program donors, such as Fund for Development, our company, the Climate Lab, East Bay, Greenhouse Co-working, Samoa Business Hub, Chonga Youth Employment and Entrepreneurship, and Vanuatu Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Uh, we'd also like to thank our panel members who have shared their experiences today and have really added value to this session. And uh, to our GEGI Deputy Director General Helena for moderating this session uh, and not forgetting all of our lovely audience who joined uh, for this session and were able to learn a lot and also uh, contribute towards the, this session through their chat question and answers. So thanks a lot to everyone here and um, this brings us to the end of the session. Uh, before you all, I'd like to wish you all a wonderful International Happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much. And uh, do stay tuned to our uh, program updates. And uh, we have the QR code on the screen. Uh, you would be able to actually access our Pacific Green for News uh, website using the QR code as well. Thank you so much.